the two markets that Indians are um, looking to focus on. One is the Southeast Asian market, right? Uh, and the other is the Middle East market, largely because both of them have similar demographics and as well as pace of growth in, in terms of you know, similarity. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Episode two, series two. Um, it just feels like yesterday, Gaurav and I started this fintech podcast. And only a few months ago, we expanded fintech to Web3. We're going to be talking about what's happening in fintech and Web3, crypto, blockchain, old fashioned Web2 fintech as well, with an India specific lens. And I'm delighted to have two good friends of mine joining us today. I'm going to guess, Amit, you're in Bangalore and wish you're in Hong Kong, but you're going to correct me if I got that wrong. No, no, you got that right. I'm from Bangalore, but in Hong Kong, but yeah. You're Bangalore in Hong Kong, and Amit, you're a transplant to Bangalore now for many years, right? Correct. I'm from a very small town in India, from North India, but I've been in Bangalore for like 15 years now. So. And as I discovered the other day when I was messaging you from a restaurant in London, your knowledge of South Indian languages is still... Canada yeah. Gautilla. <laughs> it's another story. It was another, there was, um, yeah. there was a, I think, uh, yeah, a particular South Indian language book in this restaurant in London. I was messaging all my friends in Bangalore saying, translate this to me, and like, no one had a clue, but that's another story. But anyway, we're not here to talk about South Indian languages. We're here to talk about tech and fintech. We can change and... the podcast, though. It, it, food is a good is a good topic of conversation. But yeah, we can do it. Yeah, we can you do food and language, yeah, again, yeah. right? It's more fun than fintech. But uh, before I go completely off topic, maybe Amit and Mushir, you can tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you know you've been involved in fintech and. I mean, we were just talking before we went live. We've lost track of how we first met. Was it a conference in Hong Kong, a, a field trip to Bangalore in 2016? I, I've lost track. It's uh, But suffice to say, we've been chatting about fintech for at least half a dozen years. So, I mean, tell us about how you've been, you've been involved in fintech in India. Yeah, I think as far as I can remember in fintech, uh, you have been around. So, <laughs> you know, I think you guys are like pretty old in this space. Um, so basically in 2012-13, we were crazy enough, me and my other co-founder who is in the US, he was one of the founders of Money 2020. Both of us thought that FinTech is going to be big. There was nothing called FinTech at the time. And on top of that, we started creating something we call as the Bloomberg for FinTech. So we'll not build a FinTech application. We'll actually sort of track the entire sector. I hired engineers in Bangalore. We built a technology platform to track mm -hmm. about 17,000 FinTech and InsurTech startups, uh, you know, at the top of our game about uh, 2016, 17. And yeah, so we, we had an enterprise subscription, a retail subscription, uh, both grew very well. Um, the funny thing, uh, Ronit and Gaurav was that uh, we had a blog, which was based on the insights that came from the platform and the blog became extremely popular, like among the top three FinTech blogs in the world. And so people used to say that people used to think like we are a media company, <laughs> the typical elephant and the six blind men problem. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was fun. Um, we got acquired last year uh, by a US tech company in identity authentication space. And uh, my personal passion is that I've been investing in FinTech and tech companies uh, have, uh, you know, equity in about 23, 24 global FinTech and tech companies. Some of them are now Tiger Global funded or Sequoia funded companies, half a billion dollars, two hundred million dollars. So that's like the the fun personal sort of story where I've been growing uh, as as I track fintech. And Mushir, well, I, I'm not an OG of Indian fintech like Amit. So it's, uh, I've just been playing a small part. Uh, Is there another way saying you're younger than Amit and I am? Uh, we never know, right? <laughs> it's, just the, it's just the fat on my skin that makes it a little more younger. Uh, but long story short, um, I mean, you know, look, when you, when you look at the connection to Indian fintech, I've learned so much from Amit. Amit has come to Hong Kong to talk about India stack, right? And it blew people's mind up. Um, but my story is, is much shorter. I'm, uh, as I said, born and raised in Bangalore. I started my career in traditional fintech, but people will say, what is that? It was Basically, I was an electronic trader, right? So I used to trade US and European markets from, uh, from India and Mauritius. 
And that was using technology for finance. It was the cutting edge, fighting against algorithms, trading at 200 milliseconds, uh, 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 you know, 200 milliseconds a trade. So you could see that you had technology at that stage in India, facilitated for international growth, but um, being more actively involved in fintech, say from 2015 or 2016 onwards, where I was one of the co-founders of the Fintech Association of Hong Kong, where again, people were like, why do you need fintech? Banks are good. We are happy with our banks. Credit cards are there for all payments. Octopus is there for all small payments. So what, why do you need fintech? So we helped in, we, we, we set up the fintech association. I headed it as a inaugural general manager for its, uh, for its first three years. Uh, subsequently then going on to set up FinStep Asia. Our first um, task with FinStep Asia was essentially to try to connect the Indian and the Chinese fintech ecosystem, right? Uh, in particular, I, I co-founded an initiative known as India Tech, where we wanted to highlight the growth of Indian startup ecosystem and the fintech ecosystem. And um, that's where we are. And currently what we do is we provide advisory to uh, both fintech institutions and digital asset institutions on uh, benchmarking regulatory policy, but also supporting them with research work across different themes. Thank you for that, Mishir. Um, Maybe starting, let's start with the past and then we'll go to the future. Uh, FinTech in India today is obviously a big thing, but five, six, seven years ago, I mean, what was, what did FinTech look like? What were some of the triggers to help FinTech in India grow? In many parts of the world, as Mushir has said, like in Hong Kong or in the UK, there was a gap in the market because the banks hadn't adopted or adapted to the latest digital technologies and mobile technologies as quickly in the consumer space and kind of fintechs came in, sometimes with regulatory support and, and that's how you got neobanks in London and Hong Kong. Tell us the story in India, what kind of kickstarted, what were the triggers that kickstarted growth of fintech in India? Yeah, I, I often talk about this, that Mukesh Ammani actually started all of this. Um, <laughs> basically, I think India's fintech story cannot be told without talking about how connectivity actually was like the biggest driver when Jio mm -hmm. was launched. And, and to be fair, right, credit where it goes, Airtel and Vodafone had done their job uh, to a good extent as well. But Jio is what, like, you know, I, I think in Silicon Valley, I was looking, uh, I was listening to this presentation and somebody said that, it is the fastest growing startup in the world because they got 100 million users within a few months or something like that. So yeah, so we got connectivity, you know, 4G connections, uh, the auto rickshaw wala, the, the, the uh, mom and pop shop guy now was watching, you know, videos and was consuming 25 GBs of content every, every month at the cheapest rates in the world. So, so I think, so that is one which really sort of catapulted the whole uh, you know, tech startup ecosystem, I would say, because now there were people who could download the app, who could make uh, digital transactions and, and so on. The second thing I would say is that um, we have this very unique thing in India where there are no proprietary stacks like, you know, Visa, MasterCard and so on, which are very popular in, in US. And in India, we create something called as public goods, right? So different agencies, you know, think tanks, they came together and they created things like Aadhaar, which is a digital uh, biometric uh, authentication system. It can handle 100 million transactions a day, completely digital for handling any sort of authentication, digital onboarding situations. And then we created something called UPI, uh, which is one of the best payment system in the world, as, as you know, Google also says now, and, and many people accept that globally, that it's a real-time payment system, but also it works on identifiers, it, it works on merchants, it works peer-to-peer -peer instant settlements, it, it's beautiful, right? So with these kind of systems, it what it uh, what happened is that you could do customer onboarding in a in a couple of minutes, and then you can allow them to sort of you know put money, transact, invest, uh, insure themselves, and you know the whole nine yards in financial services. The final thing I would say is that Indians generally we have grown up in like very hard situations most of the times, most of the nation, and we just somehow survive and thrive in like very difficult situations. So. That's why you see a lot of entrepreneurs. You see a lot of global tech CEOs now. We just know how to handle like pressure situations. And I think that creates a lot of engineers, entrepreneurs. And we are seeing that in FinTech space, you know. So I, I would basically say these three things. Mm -hmm. They're very macro and generic, but I think these kind of define what, what, what led to what FinTech is today. In India. So 
low cost connectivity so the geo revolution the india stack other and upi and others and some native talent natural talent uh, entrepreneurial talent and ta human talent as well uh, Mushir, is there anything else you'd add to that sort of china china china, china. china. go now, on even if you got this is controversial china helped india's fintech so hang on but india's fintech story is due to china you're saying sitting in hong kong saying, i'm giving you the fourth reason not the first reason right? so, very clearly the fourth <laughs> you may not be, you may not be allowed first. back in the country i'm just saying but so be careful what you say now <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong say I read, saw your podcast. Uh, no, look, the reason I'm saying China more so not so uh, is it's two reasons, right? One is for quite as you know for the whole most of last decade we were in many cases trying to replicate the fast growth that China had across mm -hmm. public goods, across you know fintech, etc. You know um, when you look at Paytm, essentially it draws a lot from what is Alipay, right? And then building on top of that, but Mm -hmm. Also, the fact that almost 50% of PTM was Alibaba or Ant Group, right? So you had a significant mm -hmm. influence of these players who showed what could be done at scale. And that was a very important element because outside of India and China, there's no other country that had more than 500 million people, right? So, and also a developing country. So to be able to learn those lessons was important. That's number one in terms of, okay, an example out there for you to replicate in terms of scale and, and possibly in terms of technology, what they did and models. But the second reason is as an extension of that is also VC investments that came through from mainland China. There was a time where Tencent and the Alibaba group had significant investments in quite a few of India's unicorns, not just FinTech, but across the base. And I think, and that is under, you know, underplayed, not spoken about so much, but investment is a very, very important element, right? We now have over 122 unicorns, but out of it, 62 were created in the last year and a half. Um, so we didn't really have too many unicorns. You need money to mm -hmm. allow the fintechs to do whatever they want to do. And we know that a majority of our mm -hmm. unicorns are not profitable, right? So how do you sustain that? On one side, you had a government that, you know, uh, allowed for very cheap data uh, plans because, you know, Reliance subsidized that for the rest of us because $10, 10 rupees, which is equivalent to you know 15 cents to be able to run that or in in today's world probably even 12 cents us is 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 the cheapest in the world but be be able to provide that right be able to provide a phone at 10 usd or 20 usd is not a joke you, there is some subsidy happening somewhere so on one side you have private enterprises doing it and you have investors essentially funding the story for indian fintech and enabling the fintechs to go for user acquisition providing services rather than focusing on uh, revenue uh, or profitability, let me put it that way, which has had its own downfalls and pitfalls we'll talk about. But I think that's an important element is the investor base, uh, which has fueled this uh, in, the, in the longer run. It was China, but in the near run is also China because with COVID and the geopolitics changing between US and China, a lot of American funds as well as uh, European VCs were looking at where else can they go where they're not going to face mm -hmm you know, geopolitical mm. headwinds that impact listings, et cetera. And that money came to India rather than going into major Chinese um, startups. That, that's, that's my call out. So yeah, that's why China. No, it's, a, it's an absolutely valid point. Capital is important. And China is both a provider of capital and concepts uh, is super important. I've got loads of other questions, but I don't want to bore Gaurav. Um, I don't want to pull because he probably falls asleep in his office listening to me. So I want to bring Gaurav into the conversation earlier this time. <laughs> so Gaurav, over to you. Thank you the, so much, Roy. From the global head office of Marshall FinTech Partners in Dubai. <laughs> Listen, I, I love this. You know, we, I love the way that this conversation has flowed so, so naturally, and we've come to the money so quickly. The money of, of companies working around money. So, you know, just going, just pulling on that thread a little bit, gentlemen, you know, and, and, and Amit, I'll start with you. It seems like, you know, a lot of the companies that, you know, tried to exit or have exited in recent times have not really had much success in terms of the market doing this. It's, it's early days. There's still, you know, it's a unique time and I'm sure there'll be investor sentiment will be positive on other unity economics with other fintechs that do go public probably in 2023 onwards, right? It's not doom and gloom for everyone is standard that's not fair to say so 
But, you know, having a look at the reception that's there, there's been caution, right? Um, I think the num amount of people sort of queuing up to want to do exits over 23 to 25, there's been a bit of caution and there's a bit of a readdressing of how they're actually going to go towards that path. Having said that, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the market for fintech in India is, is saturated. Uh, you know, do you feel that there's still huge amount of opportunity in fintech in India? Or do you feel the money that's supporting it is actually looking for opportunities outside as well, where funds setting up and looking towards Middle East, Africa and other places where it's not saturated, opportunities earlier, unit economics are bigger. What do you think from your perspective does India look like for the next fintech opportunities? Creation wise. Yeah. No, great and pretty loaded question. So I I'll divide in two parts. Uh, first, I think as far as the public market, uh, you know, the exits which happen. Um, so, so I think there are three things, right? One, uh, most of these, uh, uh, you know, fintech or other startups which went for IPOs, it happened at a time when the macro was also not that great. Like, you know, some of the other markets were also not doing very well. Secondly, I think there's definitely a gap in terms of uh, revenue multiples and some of the financial metrics. Uh, that these companies need to have as public market companies. But I think the biggest reason I would say is that till the time Paytm IPO'd, uh, most of the fintech companies were actually private companies and all the cheerleaders, all the people who were interested in the startup ecosystem had never seen a company, a tech company go public in India. And so we, we were just not ready for it, right? We, we, there, there's no depth of market players on the startup tech ecosystem side. So most of the people who actually invest in markets and India is a very vibrant, you know, public stock market. But I think the people are very used to seeing financials, fundamentals, and investing based on that. There's this whole tech startup IPOs was a very new thing. There was no benchmark. So, there was no barometer. There was no benchmark. Yeah, and there were not many people who actually understood startups, tech, and also were in public market investing in public markets. Right. So it, there are a few reasons for that, but I think that does not um, uh, mean that uh, these companies should not sort of work hard to, uh, you know, generate the financials and, and, and produce the metrics which is required by the public markets. I think they will learn over a period of time. Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that in a few years, you will see better results. Um, your second question is something that we often discuss like every other day, especially because I invest in uh, FinTech and tech companies all over the world. And there's definitely an idea fatigue in India with, you know, thousands and thousands of startups. So I've seen like the 600th pitch of a wealth management platform and a 300th pitch of an insure tech company. So it's, it's kind of hard. There's a lot of idea fatigue. Um, but at the same time, what is also happening is that now there, say for example, the first generation of lending companies was about giving out a term loan to a customer and you don't know where he's going to use it or she's going to use it. And you don't know how you will collect it back. That was the first generation to where we are today, where there's a company called Off Business, which is a unicorn and is profitable where they have gotten embedded in a particular supply chain, um, you know, and uh, they basically control. So from the buyer side, they've created a marketplace so you can discover, you know, smaller suppliers and you can get pricing advantage and all of that. But they also finance these suppliers. So now when they do this kind of financing, they obviously have a much better control. They have many more data points because they are in the co commerce flow as well. And at the same time, they're able to collect because they are partnering with the buyer. So it's an anchor-led model. So, you know, it, it's like these next generation of companies are actually uh, really solid. And we are seeing some of these companies, you know, coming up. So there is, there is very interesting stuff in India happening. I think we have just matured as an ecosystem. Um, having said that, I think we find lots of very interesting opportunities all over the world. You know, we just, uh, we invested in this company, which does, uh, it's like a financing platform for hardware as service companies, right? So, so there are very interesting ideas globally. We are seeing some of them. We don't see it in India. That is also true at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then stepping off from there, uh, Mashir, what I wanted to do with you is your visibility is the next part of what I wanted to explore as part of this conversation, you know, past, right. present, future is India exporting financial mm -hmm. technology or fintech companies globally, right? We talk about India, as, as a, you, you joke, you know, a pilot in India is 10 million people and people laugh, you know, that's, that's how big it is. 
because you know that's that's a pilot rock 10 million and that's the size of god knows how many countries and populations and yeah. many cities everywhere else but exporting technology out of india you know we've seen people trying to adopt a upi model uh, trying to take uh, inspiration from an aadhar model Paytm was uh, like you had done and, you know, looking at uh, WeChat or an Alipay kind of model. Are you seeing any instances of an India exporting technology in the fintech space? A great question, right? And, and I think you've already answered that with regards to one of them, which is the India stack, right? Uh, but more so UPI from that perspective. Number one, what India stack showed everybody was you could be an emerging economy with very, you know, and can build of excellent infrastructure, which can serve at scale, like 1.2 billion people in Aadhaar is not a joke. It's, it's, I don't know how, when it will be replicated, but it showed all the other emerging economies, which are roughly between 50 to 200 million people that this could be replicated, right? And now what we're seeing is UPI, which is the biggest success story in FinTech coming out of the India stack, going overseas, right? NPCI has started exploring um, partnerships in other countries, including in the Middle East, just talking with Singapore. We heard the announcement that came out last week about now you can make your payments in UK. So they're finding those partnerships. So step one, of course, is bridging the Indian ecosystem with the Indian diaspora, i.e. all of us outside of, uh, you know, the three of us outside of India. That's step one. But step two is because of this model that where they've succeeded, they can now go to a lot of the emerging economies or even for that matter, um, developed economies and and offer that uh, export as in right you can white label it and run it for them or provide that technology that's part one but part two is you are seeing companies such as m2p right you have also pine labs in other senses looking both the two markets that indians are um, looking to focus on one is the southeast asian market right uh, and the other is the middle east market largely because both of them have similar demographics and as well as pace of growth in, in terms of you know, similarity. Now, Southeast Asia is more denser. It also has uh, much larger populations per country per se uh, versus the Middle East, uh, if you look at it. But there is a lot of uh, value for Indian companies to go in because they can be competitive price-wise, right? And there is, um, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, you could say respect for Indian technology there, right? They, they look at it, you know, they appreciate what Indians can do uh, and what Indian companies can do. So this model has already started and you will see more of this in the coming years because certain Indian fintech models are going to get saturated, as you already rightly mentioned, right? So there's only so much you could do internally in India uh, and you would then start exploring where can you go and where can you replicate this? This would be in Middle East and in Southeast Asia to begin with. All, having said that, I don't see much happening in terms of exporting Indian fintech to the developed world, especially the OECD uh, in the near term. Potentially in the longer run, we may offer something beyond payments, but I, I would say currently that's probably limited to the emerging markets. I think uh, in, in summary from you know my perspective and view also as a person that, that dabbles from time to time uh, in, in investing and contributing to the ecosystems and startups, in close proximity around India and in India itself, I think there's going to be a movement of either refinancing to enable Indian companies to actually grow and expand aggressively through an m and or it'll come to a bite point where due to the leveling of economies and access to infrastructure and technology and talent, there's going to be companies in India being acquired. So it's going to be acquire or be acquired, I think is what's going to happen given with the shifts and movements of people moving from private to public and the private markets also sh showing more caution and re-upping their investments. So it's going to be an interesting time uh, over the next 18 months. So that's my own personal two cents there. And on the back of that, Ronit, I'm going to hand back to you, brother. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thanks, Tom. Maybe we can bring in the topic of the RBI and the central bank in the conversation. In, in some markets, fintech has grown almost bottom-up, uh, driven by entrepreneurs or big existing companies. In others, regulators, policymakers have given a good push. Um, I'm thinking maybe in the UK, 
definitely policymakers enabled fintech in China. It came out of entrepreneurial spirit, the huge TAM and um, existing tech companies that were diversifying into payments. In the India context, how helpful or non-helpful do you think, and I'm putting you on the spot here, uh, policymakers have been. Um, you may want to pack your bags and now leave for the airport, Amit, but uh, how, 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 how helpful have they been or not helpful? And if you were giving them like a, this is what we need for the next three years, what would you be saying? This is what we need. I mean, we know the India stack's been great and you know, full kudos to both the public sector and the private sector for doing that. Mushri's talked about how it's world-class. I think we all agree with that. I mean, actually you brought it up I mean, first, but that's all great. It's in place, but looking ahead. I'm hoping that regulators don't have the time to listen to podcasts and videos. I think they're very <laughs> probably busy. <laughs> so I, I will tell you what fintech founders often joke about in India that they basically get up every morning and check the RBI website if there has been any update or any new circular which has passed or any new thing which has happened. I would say, you know, you know, jokes apart, I think I would, I would say that India is also pretty much sort of, you know, India FinTech is built by entrepreneurs, 99% uh, of it, I think. But the regulator is very prudent and very progressive, actually. You know, credit where it goes, right? So uh, if they did not create these very conducive conditions and let uh, NPCI create these platforms, we would not have been where we are in terms of digital payment transactions and stuff like that. Um, having said that, I think they are very focused on saving that small guy, the consumer, right? And so they do everything possible. And, and we have to remember that in a country of 1.3 billion people, uh, there have been many Subroto Roy's and there have been many scamsters and there have been many platforms which have duped people of money. So mm -hmm. the regulator is just like very concerned about, you know, like these fintech companies should not, you know, repeat the same thing. And there is a section of the companies which have been served ED notices and all that. I think it's all in the public domain. Um, so they need to do their job, I think. But at the same time, um, as you know, right, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm getting into the controversial <laughs> arena now that a lot of good fintech companies or great fintech companies have been built in uh, the area of regulatory arbitrage or regulatory gaps, as we call it, because regulators do have a regulation for this and this and this, but then there is always gaps. And, you know, there are very creative people in fintech space who obviously utilize and, and, and work on that. I, I think the thing is that as long as you are not duping people of money and, you know, if you are actually creating something which will be very, very useful and, and still not sort of break any laws, I, I think uh, many interesting solutions can be built, right? So uh, I, I think the regulator is concerned about the bigger issues such as, uh, you know, the Subroto Roy kind of situations. I think. They are otherwise very progressive and very uh, have been very helpful uh, at a broader scale. Same question for you, Bashir. Um, look, uh, there are two sides to most regulators, right? One is, is there a need to do consumer protection? And then the other side is trying to enable economic growth, right? To a certain extent, though it's a financial ministry's role, but they need to say, ensure there's no barriers to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the RBI has been fairly facilitating for the Indian market and the Indian consumer uh, uh, on most counts, right? So allowing UPI to grow the way they did, right? Uh, and enabling most fintechs to operate very quickly. Right? So licenses wasn't an issue. You had even players like Google coming on board and being able to offer services without really having a license, right? Google at one stage had what? 30, 40% of UPI turnover, right? So they have allowed that to uh, take place. And as is the case with most markets and maturing uh, markets, I, would, I think what they're now doing is trying to bring in a lot more governance and structure. So it's no longer a question of, okay, what we have done, would that impede you know, uh, financial inclusion or fintech inclusion? That I think that targets have more or less been achieved in terms of models. Now they're trying to figure out models where they see, okay, we need more regulatory oversight. We need we need to see where the AML risks are coming in from. We need to see where the credit risks are coming in from. A, a, a fact that most people try to forget is the Indian regulator has typically been very hawkish when it comes to prudence and you know, application of uh, regulations. Right? They're not um, as um, open uh, in terms of being very loose or you know, being very you know, pragmatic uh, too quickly. They do want to play it safe. And that's what they are now coming back to. And I, I, I generally agree. 
Uh, having said that, I think there are a few places where the RBI needs to review how they approach the coming 10 years in India, right? Uh, to align with where the government is trying to, you know, digital India and all the initiatives. One is reviewing how they come up with grander schemes or licensing regimes, right? The uh, the the new uh, umbrella entities as was being looked at, right? But there was like three competitors to NPCI, and then you went through this whole process of inviting a host of uh, applicants, including some very big names, you know, in the uh, in the country. And then there was a pause to it, or maybe we are moving away from it, right? We've seen that happen. So I would think that they need to be very uh, careful about how this is seen from an outside perspective, but also from a private industry perspective in terms of being more clear, being having more clearer guidelines uh, on such things. Secondly is the, uh, I also believe from a communication perspective, uh, although the RBI has an innovation hub, I, RBI needs a proper uh, FinTech team that will communicate everything that the RBI is doing in a more clarity. There is a payments team, there is conversations, but it, we are involved in a, a, a bunch of groups where some, when a new directive comes in, it's almost like, what is this? Like, how is this going to impact us? Does this work? Does it not? Or well, let's get some lawyers to explain this to us. Ideally, it should be the RBI explaining that to everybody and engaging them. So involving the industry more at an earlier stage before formulating what could be very industry game-changing uh, uh, regulations or uh, changes, I think is, is going to be important from an RBI perspective, right? Uh, and finally, if I had to say, um, I also think there's too much focus on RBI in India. SEBI is awfully quiet on innovation, uh, whereas if you look at most um, uh, emerge, I mean, both emerging as well as developed economies where fintech has prospered, the Securities Commission tends to be very actively involved in that element, right? Or showcasing or, or answering. For example, when it comes to crypto, you barely heard anything, if at all, from SEBI in, in India, while RBI has been spoke, speaking from a monetary perspective, currency perspective, but very little out of SEBI. So I think that clarity that is needed in terms of implement, but engagement from SEBI, they need to really uh, also get more involved and be more uh, active in the industry. That's me looking from outside in. One last question to wrap up, rapid fire. Yeah. What in India FinTech is overhyped and overrated? And what is underrated, underhyped, where there's going to be a lot of opportunity so basically, what should you sell and what should you buy in a way? But uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> as you were stopped, Wishy, let's go with you first, then Ahmed to bring it home. So since we spoke about SEBI, this is not investment advice. Any conversation, <laughs> please take this place on your own risk. When you're selling or buying anything, it's not me for you. Absolutely, um, not financial let, advice. And, and, and Mushir yeah. is not my friend. I don't know him. Okay, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know Mushir either. Some random guy in Hong Kong. Right. <laughs> um, totally random. Um, no, look, I, I think from what's underrated uh, in India is, um, is e-commerce play, right? The fintech to e-commerce play. Uh, what geos just not i mean what geos launched with whatsapp uh, that can really be a game changer uh, in the in the medium to long term and i don't think people are paying as much attention to something like that when you look at what ping dodo alibaba did in in uh, in china it was largely using these uh, messaging apps to uh, amplify their sales right and uh, and engage people same thing with wechat as well so those are very important elements and so uh, i think that's slightly underrated along with if i had to extend that the wealth industry in India is, is underrated. Um, overrated in India is the Web3 opportunity. Super overrated. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, if I have to qualify why, yes, India may have what they call crypto users, not really crypto users, as people speculating largely. And that yeah. is the attraction when you have wild swings and an opportunity to you know, make it big and make it large. Uh, why I say the Web3 opportunity is super overrated is because the regulatory environment in India is going to be challenging from a pure DeFi perspective. We already see from a, you know, just cryptocurrency uh, and trading, et cetera, is a challenge. Currently, there's no clarity, but if you're looking to go full DeFi, when more mature regulators, when it comes to this space, are tightening mm -hmm. the screws, that Web3 opportunity in India is going to be tighter and also applicability wise, you know, the excitement that we talk about for Web3, uh, Metaverse, et cetera. Look, I'm, I'm a believer in that. I do believe that will be there, but I do believe that's super overhyped in terms of the potential in India in the near term. Yeah. Got it. Got it. 
I meant the same question to you. Overrated, overhyped, and underrated, underhyped. Okay. I think overrated, overhyped is definitely new banks and a lot of consumer fintech. Um, partly because based on the consumer growth, uh, user growth they are able to show, which is funded by the VCs. I think they just uh, keep coming up in media and you know on Twitter and everywhere. So they are like very overhyped, right? Most of the new banks and uh, and any other consumer fintech company as well. I think underrated are really um, fintech companies which are actually trying to attack the offline world. Um, people don't talk about these companies. Like there are companies which have branches and technology and are doing very well and they're profitable. There are There is a system called, like we talk about UPI and Aadhaar, nobody talks about AEPS called Aadhaar Enabled Payment System, which allows cash withdrawals in a village and a small town using the biometrics. And the volumes on that have been growing really, really fast. So nobody talks about some of these offline fintech things which are happening. Around. Under height. Got it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Amit and Mushir. It's been a pleasure to talk about the uh, the past, present, and future of fintech in India. Uh, lots to chew over, and hope we can keep this conversation going in future episodes. Thanks, Ronan. I, I have said this before. I'll say it again. You are the best moderator of any podcast or any panels in the world. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thanks, much. Anika and Gaurav. Thanks for having both of us. And as always, a pleasure. Thank you.